going to start by reading a few things that I've written recently. Um, one is, the first is in response to the massacre, really, um, in uh, South Carolina, the Emmanuel Dunham. It's called The Sunday After June 17, 2015. Innocuous as the breeze through the window of the car, the pastor and her sermon from the balcony of an A-frame to a field, a congregation of parked cars, an outdoor service. But her message is just as lovely. Language over the radio on multitudes, on John's words, on the flesh, on life, on how the gospel poet baptized bread as a divine metaphor to satiate our spiritual hungers, our language as a yeast to raise us up everlasting life. And it was not so much about what she said that morning, not so much about her oaths, long and lilted, imperfect Minnesotan, not her sobriety, her typical restraint, not her good Lutheran manners, inherited from generations of Larsons, Olsons, Lindholms, you know, decent Scandinavians, who would never overstay their welcome, never think to overstep a boundary. Not her baker's grace. It was what my sister did not say. The next one is a sequence. Um, I'm bouncing back and forth between calling it auto da fe, um, referencing Inquisition acts of faith given before people were murdered, really. Um, act of faith. And it moves in roughly nine short sequences, so I'll just say one, two. Um, the first is chorus. Execution style. O oh, Emmanuel, execution style. A routine traffic stop turned hanging. O oh, Emmanuel, nine. A sidewalk chokehold. An empty clip. An unarmed back. Execution style. O oh, Emmanuel, church sign. See with forgiveness. And, the, and only the Lord knows what the Lord knows, how difficult it is to breathe. One. In the beginning, the word, a language, and stories. Stories about flying away. Stories about sailing away. Stories about flying and sailing home. Stories about deliverance. Deliverance from deliverance from a flood, an ark, stories about conception, immaculate and genocide, about food, especially about food, when there was none, a part in a blood-red sea, Eden, Arcadia, Galilee, heaven, Babylon, Zion, paradise, stories born in struggle, stories emerged from dull pain, infinite stories that nourish the roots and leaves of our family trees, grown dependent on that liquid pain. A liquid variable, a liquid shapeshifter, internal, external, lions, coyotes, spiders, bears, vultures, jackals, hyenas that tear at our present by tearing at the flesh of our past, our carcass, our bodies that once upon a time wretched violently from such poisons, such words, such stories that christen chosen ones, stories told so many times, the storytellers begin to believe, become immune to the venom that poisons their word arrows. Two, cross lake from above, a map of 
blue, scattered green scratches of land. Lakes galore. Cross lake on the ground, a pine and birch and oak forest shoreline. Sleepy lands. Cross lake face to face, a toe headed, tan, young girl or boy with watermelon and corn and lemonade at the local fireman's annual beef feed. Three. Up north, despite the peace of a quiet Isthmus lane, we carry on. Traditions of ancient Europeans and all their Viking might, their stories like weapons, stout, blunt words, anger, berserk, earth, bleak, club, cur, die, geyser, glitter, gun, heathen, hell, Husband. Words to illuminate fear, alight the unfamiliar forest shores, inflame the rush and cross lake, the marble of devil's river, nay, yellow medicine, river, nay, pajutazi, of deer, a white tailed silhouette against the backdrop of oceanic lakes, of turtle swamps and cornfields, and of memory, memory like an explosive for each and every lap, each and every white cap, romantic as any country song, every whine, every loom call over sentry pines, over watchman pines, along eroding stonewalled shorelines, and at dusk, when old men in John Deere caps and coveralls embellish stories from the hunt deep into summer night, no lamplight to invade the dark, we all agree never made sense to call pitch black, rather dark as a catalog of textures, silky, woolly, empty, blue, dark as a romantic summer love, dark as a girl or a boy met on the dock, after dark, dark beneath stars, stars like blueprints for a splendid future together, beyond two weeks spent mostly apart, dark as a love for one another, dark as an unfamiliar world, a world beyond the limits of our tragically limited field of vision. Oh, how isolated we are, love, so distant we are from in the beginning, how much we have forgotten, Christ, however will we begin, again, however will we rescue our petrified memory. Four. Up north, and are we not dear ones? Are we not the very ones responsible for the maintenance of old stories? Are we not the very ones who have mistaken generations of names, words for what we believe we heard. The very ones who misspelled, misread, misheard. The very ones who reduced entire races of people. People, for God's sake, to objects, numbers, statistics, characters, archetypes, and tales. Tales that grow more and more distant from the lived-in world, the world we experience in the body, the flesh, the very ones, love, who have created a master the American dream. Like a hypnosis, an illusion, a fiction that validates our desire for escape from whatever, wherever, whomever we choose. A tale that legislates. A tale that terminates. Six. Up north, how a person ignores deterioration. It's five o'clock somewhere. The deterioration of forests, wildlife, reflects the way they ignore destruction. Destruction caused by the ancient stories, the Zionists of divine right, the destruction of bodies, bodies which have over time been reduced to stock, characters, cartoons, archetypes, without histories, without families, without complexities, without consciousness, bodies as objects, bodies coined, nobodies. Nothing, a violence I will not repeat. Here, bodies branded a problem. Dear grandmother, dear grandfather, oh, won't you forgive me? Forgive me, won't you forgive me for what I've said? I'm sorry, but won't you forgive me for what I'm about to say? For years now, 
and I mean for 30 some odd years now. I've been meaning to ask you for all these years now. I've been meaning to say, well, won't you please explain to me, dear grandfather? Well, won't you play, please explain to me, dear grandmother? Won't you please explain? I've run out of excuses. Excuses for you, excuses for us. I simply cannot understand how we can live through this time. I simply cannot understand how we can live through centuries of executions on our badge and in our names. I simply cannot begin to comprehend how we can curse any small boy or any small girl or any young woman, any young man, let alone black boy or black girl or black woman or man shot in the back in Selma, Harlem, Florida, South Carolina. Um, the anywhere but up here, yet weep, and I mean weep sincerely over the death of a black lab. Oh, won't you please explain, won't you please explain without the ire that stomps a skull to make certain even the soul is dead, without the lighter fluid to ignite, to burn the crosses we are meant to bear, without the rage that executes Wednesday evening Bible study, without the bullets that silence the preachers, the leaders, the doctors, the mass, or oh, won't you please explain how a people of God, and are we not a people of God, dear grandmother, dear grandfather, or oh, won't you please explain? Up north, slurs that once burned the tongue no longer do. Slurs come object, slurs transform, manifest wildly as fences, sturdy walls, new roofs, weatherall, sealant, stains, bug sprays, bug zappers, bug candles, screened-in porches, beer, booze, fake tans, crystal meth, cigarettes, private drives, between the illusion of us and the even more delusional them. The forest, the unknown, the wolf, never the rabbit, loping, back and forth along the perimeter, a wolf with the taste of blood, and if answers are what we are looking for, Worse, if it is answers we find. Solutions for the how or the why we have arrived here, wherever in the hell we are, wherever in the hell we think we are. Just let them go. Yes, let them go. Let all the answers as cause go. Let all the answers as absolutes go. Let answers as solutions go. Answers held on to dear life. For, held on to for dear life. Answers for a dear life, which which strangle us, asphyxiate us to waking death. Yes, let them go. Let the chosen ones go. Let the prisoners go. The police officers go. The jailers, the prisons, the architects. Let the judiciary go. Let all the stories go. Our divinity. Yes, let them go. Yes, let the Bibles go. The constitutions go. The bloody flags go. The Batterets go, let all the money go, let all the colors go, let up north for the love of God, let the people go. Lord, hear our prayer. Hold it. Still dark, near first light, on the horizon a throb, or is it a hum of either crickets, the wings of a hummingbird, or silence? Quiet, so pregnant, it hums. Morning on the dock, and the color of water, a kaleidoscope. Neither black nor white, no entire rainbows of each shifting and changing, which with each breath of light. And this one is for Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinian poet, passed away in 2008. Um, I was in Senegal at the time, working for an institute called the Gori Institute, and one of his dear friends was the executive director at the time. And so we received the news together, and he had been such a part of my brief reading life that I felt compelled to write something. So this is called the Butterfly and Testament. From Akum Darwish, thanks to Fadi Judah, the translator. He hears a neighbor's charged with treason. The coffee's cold and the French bread stale. Flies cling to a ramekin of apricot jam. 
but more than a fig for another day. In his dreams, he invites his enemies, though they are none, to join him for tea. And if they were to sit for once, they would sit like a family would, so that poet and killer alike could eat their fill. In his dreams, he forgives them in the voice of a monarch, butterfly, one by one while reciting songs everyone knows well, careful not to single anyone out. The cadence softens their skins, like sea salt and like tea, it calms their nerves. What a shame no one stops to eat anymore. No wonder gunpowder replaces sugar. May we never forget the taste of a date, August 9th. <clears throat> this one is for Edward Snowden and Brand Bradley Manning. Bradley Manning. And I wrote all the notes. It's from a longer piece called Morning Light. News from the city always travels in the most circuitous ways. Although, to the couple at the table next to him, he was just your average eavesdropper. He heard something about how a poet had written a poem as a calendar for the holidays America values most. And after mention of the Super Bowl, the tax season, and Black Friday, he remembered he had to meet her at the beach with the lifeguard stand where the sun had melted the shore, lying just enough for a brace of ducks to squeeze into a crisp morning bath. She tossed chucks of baguette into the only unoccupied corner, so as not to inconvenience the bathers who were there to bathe, not eat, as if she were mourning already. The poet who exposed the small few, the poor boy who would be silent later in the day, as the institutions scrambled to erase his benedictions. And it's called The Real Marvelous. After the pool empties, before the cicadas rev down, the view, although I've never been, is a Haitian view. Banyan trees, gardenias, and flies all around your eye planting her abandoned rose, perfumed and in a lemon dress, near the roots of a tree. Forget about magical realism. Her world is of this world, though it's a miracle, as much as it's not, that anyone can see her at all. There's no telling where the she of she begins, nor where she ends. The she who inhabits so many bodies, Bodies who inhabit her, bodies who lend her their shape. All at once, they are the real and the maravilloso, the terribly real, makut and machetes, the liquid meanwhile around the salted eyes of the raft off the coast of South Beach. The in-between night and day women, old grannies with pipes, together with rows, like a crowd of hands, braiding our hair with everything. This one is also after uh, another Haitian poet. His name is uh, Louis-Philippe d'Alembert, and I came to know his work through, from reading which and uh, I got a book of his in France somewhere and I tried my hand at translating but my French is shit and so I made a version of what he had written and uh, the poems he sent me and called it after Louis, Philippe, Louis Philippe d'Alembert. For those who without warning bow out without giving us time to host, hoist sails 
or leave the harbor without a last embrace, without one last kiss, without an afternoon in the courtyard gathered around warm bursts of laughter, memories more vast than the nothingness of ancestors gathering for, gathered for the party without the clucking of guinea fowl, the furtive visits of lizards, the waltz of loved ones bearing words of celebration, sometimes without a word, the warm brotherhood, the back and forth, swaying of servants pouring whiskey, ginger tea, and bitter coffee, the worthy servants who mourn so much the departed think they're one of theirs, or death, like life, is everyone's business. Let's invite each of the deceased with the words of praise, with the words of respect, words fit at least for an instant, for an afternoon of farewell and friendship to ward off the absence of words for later, further to the north of life, to strangle the paths of loneliness, to praise him each word as long as it's not perfumed on this earth and invite everyone to drink and sing Hosanna to the departed angels, Hosanna to every angel, big, small, good, bad, as if grief does not remain in these places, as if grief has no regency here on earth, as if grief were a cyclone without wings, without flames. Thank you again. This is apostrophe. When you remember me, remember Indonesian teak, the bus to Surabaya, the bright red leaves we stole from the woods. When you remember me, remember morning in our private garden, the struggle vent sleeping one off on the park side of the wall, and the angel winged geese squalling for crumbs. When you remember me, Remember roses heavy with rain, or in mourning their scattered petals like marble tombstones on the lawn. Remember how they bowed their pinkish heads.